Hi there. For spooky seasons, I'd like to read an extract from Mary Shelley's On Ghosts. She starts the essay claiming that she's living through a rational age, uh, that people in her era are much more likely to explain strange phenomena by referring to science and reason than they are to blame ghosts and ghouls. And then she spends the essay testing that claim, sometimes playfully. So this is the extract. There is something beyond us of which we are ignorant. The sun drawing up the vaporous air makes a void and the wind rushes in to fill it. Thus beyond our souls can, there is an empty space and our hopes and fears in gentle gales or terrific whirlwinds occupy the vacuum. And if it does no more, it bestows on the feeling heart a belief that influences do exist to watch and guard us though they may be impalpable to the course of faculties. I've heard that when Coleridge was asked if he believed in ghosts, he replied that he had seen too many to put any trust in their reality. And the person of the most lively imagination that I ever knew echoed this reply. But these were not real ghosts, pardon unbelievers my mode of speech that they saw. They were shadows, phantoms unreal, that while they appalled the senses, yet carried no other feeling to the mind of others than delusion, and were viewed as we might view an optical deception, which we see to be true with our eyes and know to be false with our understanding. I speak of other shapes, the returning bride who claims the fidelity of her betrothed, the murdered man who shakes to remorse the murderer's heart, ghosts that lift the curtains at the foot of the bed as the clock times one, who rise all pale and ghostly from the churchyard and haunt their ancient abodes, who, spoken to, reply, and whose cold and unearthly touch makes the hair stand stark upon the head, the true old-fashioned, foretelling, flitting, gliding ghost, who has seen such a one? I have known two persons who at broad daylight have owned that they believed in ghosts, for that they had seen one. One of these was an Englishman and the other an Italian. The former had lost a friend he dearly loved, who for a while appeared to him nightly, gently stroking his cheek and spreading a serene calm over his mind. He did not fear the appearance, although he was somewhat awe-stricken as each night it glided into his chamber and Ponzi del Luto Insula Sponda Manca placed itself on the left side of the bed. This visitation continued for several weeks when by some accident he altered his residence and then he saw it no more. Such a tale may easily be explained away, but several years had passed and he, a man of strong and virile intellects, said that he had seen a ghost. The Italian was a noble, a soldier, and by no means addicted to superstition. He had served in Napoleon's armies from early youth and had been to Russia, had fought and bled, and been rewarded, and he unhesitatingly and with deep relief recounted his story. This chevalier, a young and somewhat a miraculous incident, a gallant Italian, was engaged in a duel with a brother officer and wounded him in the arm. The subject of the duel was frivolous, and distressed therefore at its consequences, he attended on his useful adver youthful adversary during his consequent illness, so that when the latter recovered, they became firm and dear friends. They were quartered together at Milan where the youth fell desperately in love with the wife of a musician who disdained his passion so that it preyed on his spirits and his health. He absented himself from all amusements, avoided all his brother officers, and his only consolation was to pour his lovesick plaints into the ear of the chevalier who strove in vain to inspire him either with indifference towards the fair disdainer or to inculcate lessons of fortitude and heroism. As a last resource, he urged him to ask leave of absence and to seek either in change of scene or the amusement of hunting, some diversion to his passion. One evening, the youth came to the chevalier and said, well, I have asked leave of absence and am to have it early tomorrow morning. So lend me your fowling piece and cartridges for I shall go to hunt for a fortnight. The Chevalier gave him what he asked. Among the shot, there were a few bullets. I will take these also, said the youth, to secure myself against the attack of any wolf, for I mean to bury myself in the woods. 
Although he had obtained that for which he came, the youth still lingered. He talked of the cruelty of his lady, lamented that she would not even permit him a hopeless attendance, but that she inexorably banished him from her sight. So that, said he, I have no hope but in oblivion. At length he rose to depart. He took the chevalier's hand and said, you will see her tomorrow. You will speak to her and hear her speak. Tell her, I entreat you, that our conversation tonight has been concerning her and that her name was the last that I spoke. Yes, yes, cried the chevalier. I will see anything you please, but you must not talk of her any more. You must forget her. The youth embraced his friend with warmth. The latter saw nothing more in it than the effects of his affection. Combined with his melancholy at absenting himself from his mistress, whose name, joined to a tender farewell, was the last sound that he uttered. When the chevalier was on guard that night, he heard the report of a gun. He was at first troubled and agitated by it, but afterwards thought no more of it, and when relieved from guard went to bed, although he passed a restless, sleepless night. Early in the morning, someone knocked at his door. It was a soldier who said that he had got the young officer's leave of absence and had taken it to his house. The servant had admitted him and he had gone upstairs, but the room door of the officer was locked and no one answered to his knocking, but something oozed through from under the door that looked like blood. The chevalier, agitated and frightened at this account, hurried to his friend's house, burst open the door and found him stretched on the ground. He had blown out his brains and the body lay a headless trunk, cold and stiff. The shock and grief which the Chevalier experienced in consequence of this catastrophe produced a fever which lasted for some days. When he got well, he obtained leave of absence and went into the country to try to divert his mind. One evening at moonlight, he was returning home from a walk and passed through a lane with a hedge on both sides, so high that he could not see over them. The night was balmy, the bushes gleamed with fireflies, brighter than the stars which the moon had veiled with her silver light. Suddenly, he heard a rustling near him, and the figure of his friend issued from the hedge and stood before him, mutilated as he had seen him after his death. This figure he saw several times, always in the same place. It was impalpable to the touch, motionless, except in its advance, and made no sign when it was addressed. Once the chevalier took a friend with him to the spot. The rustling was heard, the same shadow crept forth, his companion fled in horror, but the chevalier stayed, vainly endeavouring to discover what called his friend from his quiet tomb, and if any act of his might give repose to the restless shade. Such are my two stories, and I record them the more willingly, since they occurred to men and to individuals distinguished the one for courage and the other for sagacity.